Our major components were all recycled parts. So we built it out of recycled parts. So the abstracts are a group of basically tasks to develop and taking care of plastic pollution inside bays and binders, where it all basically originated from. And remote control operated to reduce man hours. So Bethel Body reached out to us and they have like maybe five people per vessel for one trip. You take an eight hour day, that's 40 hours. Time's up at the wage, it's a lot of money. All right, so we were trying to at least knock out the man hours. So big problem saves trash accumulates in the waterways, bayous. Big thing about the Alice is tourism, spring break. You don't want to go to the beach after spring break. So it's pretty trashed and it just all floating, stuff like that, turtles, everything. So our kind of identification record makes me want to give a special thank you to uh, Proceanic. Uh, we got a representative here, uh, Richard Hart. Uh, uh, thanks for coming out. Um, and also, uh, we've been talking to Mark Waller, which is uh, the CEO of Proceanic. Uh, basically, they're a ROV company that do like inspections uh, on um, big, uh, like the big oil rigs and stuff like that. Um, so. This uh, plastic pollution problem is actually a widespread problem here in the, and really all around the world. Uh, it affects uh, the environment, it affects marine life. And uh, so the plastic could get back to its original state, uh, it takes years. And then that turns into uh, micro uh, microplastics and that's even more of a danger to uh, marine, I mean, marine uh, life. Uh, also, we're working with Galveston uh, Bay Foundation. They're a local uh, foundation here in the Galveston area where they specialize in beach cleanup. They pick up, they do a lot of uh, volunteer work here in the area. They pick up plastic um, bottles, uh, bags, other stuff like this that affects uh, marine life. Uh, project goals and objectives. Um, uh, originally, we had a different parking scope, or like a bigger parking scope, or a scale. We had a boat that was about 20 foot long, uh, about 9 foot wide, but we downscaled due to budgeting. And also, originally, we were supposed to carry about 100 pounds of trash, but we moved down to about 30 to, 20 to 30 pounds of trash, uh, plastic pollution. We also uh, made a fully RC, like, uh, our, uh, like Jim said, to reduce man hours. Uh, only one person really needs to be operating the vessel and maybe two people to offload the, the bay when it's full. Um, it's also able to uh, navigate in permissible weather. You'll see it floating in the water. You'll see the water line um, and it needs to be easy to operate it. So the RC is it's not very complicated. It's just a controller and it has throttle inputs that is uh, able to turn the uh, motors and the conveyor belt and able to move the rudders as well. Uh, project specifications, the dimension of the boat is nine foot and a half long and five and a half foot wide. Um, the hole from the bottom to the deck is about a foot and a half. Um, we also have two motors that are one horsepower motors that are DC motors. So um, the way that this project, the, the power for the project works is we have a generator that is AC power and it holds about a gallon of gas, uh, three, three hours of operating time in, in the bay is running out. Um, and so it's AC power, goes into a breaker box, and the breaker box is split into, uh, it has an input of two, 240 volts, and it's split into 120 on each bus bar. From there, it um, goes into our two controllers, our speed controllers, which are ACN and zero to 90 volts DC out for our one horsepower motor. Uh, that's our uh, power works. Um, we, we calculated that in order to move our boat, which weighed about uh, 780 pounds about, we needed about two horsepower to move it to propel it at about five knots. Able to carry about 20 pounds of trash and it is fully cool RC. All right, so for relevant codes and standards and some project constraints, starting with our standards, uh, couldn't find too much in terms of Coast Guard applications of applying to like an ROV vessel. So we took what we had in terms of uh, powered vessels that are 16 foot long and applied it to ours. Then uh, since we are ROV, we didn't have to include a lot of safety measures that you would find on a manned vessel. 
So that would just be our navigation lights, which is red, port, green, starboard with a white running light in the back. And then ventilation for our onboard generator, which is fully enclosed. Uh, it has to have free flow ventilation to prevent, you know, heat buildup, exhaust, and whatnot. Then for our control standards, uh, those are given to us from the FCC, Federal Communications. Uh, they provide for our operating frequencies, which our control system you know, utilizes to control our power, rudder, and uh, our clash, trash collection belt. And uh, in the FCC, we have to abide by Rule 47, Part 95, which uh, just determines like recreational use of uh, telecommunications. And then for project constraints, we need a vessel that would meet a carry capacity and a trash containment capacity while maintaining a proper vessel stability, not exceeding a GM that would cause our vessel to you know, capsize or not be able to recover from a substantial list. And then we needed some power propulsion requirements, obviously with almost a 800 pound vessel, pushing it with two horsepower, you know, is a pretty substantial feat. And then uh, for environmental operating conditions, we have a fairly low draft, and with that minimum you know, power requirement, we can't operate in two rough waters, but you know, a substantial like one foot swell we can still operate in. Okay, so this is our project schedule as of uh, yesterday. We pretty much stayed on task a whole the whole year, especially this semester with building. Our guys have, we all put in roughly 500 man hours on constructing this project. Yeah, that's for sure. So, uh, with all of that and the testing, as soon as we built something, we were able to test it. Um, the, the big test was yesterday with the float and the conveyor with everything on it, and it was successful. So, uh, we were pretty much on task and we're, uh, we're golden. Okay, so here's our engineering design task map. Uh, we had three major components, containment, collection, and propulsion. Uh, containment, we uh, got a nice little lightweight bin going compared to the first one we built. Uh, the collection was a conveyor belt system, which was all made on recyclable parts from treadmills and stuff like that. And the propulsion, which was electrical powered, used by, actually used a generator, and it was all remote control operated. Okay, so we have our final cost and building materials. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of things that we've needed to acquire, uh, but luckily we were able to- You maybe want to move yeah. out so we can see. We received some funding from Prescianic and uh, the school, but we reached around $2,000 for uh, most of the items, and a lot of them were donated, uh, or we were able to get from Home Depot or uh, Amazon. Okay, so this is our description of the design. Uh, starting off with the hole, the original design was a pontoon and uh, we had to connect it back together from one of the original previous uh, senior design groups. So it was two holes, uh, aluminum, and then we were to account for the buoyancy that we were needing to support a lot of our equipment. We had to uh, repurpose a plastic pedal boat that Chris was kind enough to bring and uh, we just mounted it underneath to give us more buoyancy. Uh, for the deck, we went to Home Depot and we were able to get two uh, three-quarter inch marine grade uh, plywood and we mounted it to the deck and we cut four aft uh, compartments in order to house most of our uh, uh, propulsion and control systems. And then to finish it off, we took some diamond plate rubber mat and cut it out and lined it up with the compartments in order to help with vibration and the wick sleep. Uh, so for the conveyor, we have uh, two combined repurposed treadmills that we were donated from the school. Uh, one of them was Chris too as well. And um, we took the belt and we added some aluminum cleats in order to help grab all the plastic in the water. We have it sitting around a foot in the water right now from the top of uh, the conveyor down. It's about seven and a half feet, I think. And then um, so our containment unit's gone through several phases. Uh, the first phase, was a little bit too heavy. It was constructed out of uh, expanded metal and angle, uh, angle iron. It proved to be way too heavy for what we needed. That was our original 100 pound load. Uh, so then we downgraded it to a chemical container that we cut and uh, helped to fit the width of the boat. Uh, we added some chicken wire netting to the sides in order to keep all the plastic in. 
And then um, we also constructed a wooden uh, frame to the bottom for it to sit on, and it has a top that tapers down, and it sits at, uh, in the back or stern of the boat in order to drain all of that excess water. Uh, and then for our propulsion, we have two one horsepower motors that are mounted inside uh, the aft compartments, uh, and they're also watertight sealed, and they're uh, water control with independent reversing. So this just kind of shows a representation of uh, the dimensions of the drawing. This was one of the original designs. Uh, as Like I said before, the, the containment unit is actually located further back so that way we can drain most of the water uh, in the stern. And uh, but yeah, we have our nine and a half by five foot vessel. Uh, you can see the plastic waste in the blue. And then the RC Arduino is actually housed in these aft compartments. And uh, you can see the two DC power motors that are in the back right there. And then our treadmill. All right, now we're gonna go to the pumps uh, on the map behind me. So uh, before we could do any tests in the water, we make sure to use SP and uh, Hexal to test our boat. Thanks to uh, Mr. Coleman for teaching all of that to us <laughs> these past semesters. And so, First of all, we use a recycle hole. So basically when you design a ship, it's way easier because you already have the dimensions to input into one of these programs. But here, we use a recycle hole, so we have to measure very carefully the hole and every component that was going to be touching the water to make sure the water lines were precise. And so from SPE, we could, uh, well, first of all, let me apologize because I'm not using SI units, I just do it on my metric system. <laughs> So the length between perpendiculars is 277.255 centimeters. The beam is uh, 150 centimeters and the depth is 38.305 centimeters. So here we have a table of offsets. There's three of these because this table right here is just for the outer poles. And then we have another table of offsets for the middle pole and another one for the deck. So these are basically just measurements from measuring from the app, uh, from the uh, app to forward. And yeah, from here we, we could render the boat and get some hydrostatic properties like the forward and aft drafts, the, uh, the center of gravity from the keel and the metacentric height, which is very important for stability. Uh, so here we have a, a front view of the vessel. This was uh, done in SDE. And here's what I'm talking about. We have our center of gravity. Here we have the distance from the keel to the center of gravity and the metacentric pipe. So uh, the light shift properties for this ship were tested in the pool in uh, fresh water. And the kg was estimated by, by hand. It was all um, handmade. So the kg was 28.7 centimeters. That's this distance from the keel to the center of gravity. Our GM was 348.3 centimeters. That's pretty high, but the higher the GM is better because that's the initial stability of the boat. So it's its um, ability to turn back into its uh, stable position. So the higher the GM, the better. And our displacement was 146. I estimated it to be 147 kilograms whenever we, we uh, weighted everything in the shot. Came out to be 146, which is quite precise. And next. So here we have a full body plan, front, top side, you can see the whole boat through SPE. And we got the hydrostatic table of properties down here. This was very crucial because on SPE you basically design the ship and then Texel uh, helps us to uh, uh, get the uh, board and apparatus and loading uh, properties whenever you put any items on the boat, how is it going to react on uh, stability. So from the table of property, the hydrostatic table of properties, we got we needed to find the uh, longitudinal center of gravity, which was needed to be included into Hexel. This was done by, basically we got the uh, longitudinal center of buoyancy from the table of top, from the higher side uh, table. And we multiplied the trim, which is the difference between the forward and after axis, times the moment to trim one centimeter for the boat, and divided it by the whole uh, displacement, light shift displacement. And from there we got a distance, and that distance was subtracted from the longitudinal center of buoyancy, and that way we got the 
LCG basically. And that's the LCG from the measuring from the aft to forward. Now I'll show you in the next uh, slide what I'm saying. So here's Hexel. That's the light shift properties right now. That's without any load. Before we put any loads on the boat, uh, we tested this in the pool. That's why I got the, the tracks. And initially, so yeah, like I mentioned, GM 348.3 centimeters, KG 28.7. And the boat was really stable before any loads, like you would think. And yeah, so here we have more pictures of it. And then the next slide. So here, uh, that's when we uh, inputted all the loads into Excel. So I had to find the uh, center of gravity, the longitudinal center of gravity, transverse and vertical center of gravity for each component that was placed on the vessel, as well as the uh, initial displacement of the vessel. And these loads were inputted into Excel. And from there, we got um, our load, loaded shift properties. And yeah, like I mentioned. All those. So that's the shape. Well, you can't really see it because these boxes are basically the loads, but that was the same picture as before with the boat on the water. And so our draft, it was initially 15.1 centimeters in the front before loading, and the aft was 15.8 centimeters. And it came out to 20.87 in the front, 24.8 in the back, and an average of 22.83 centimeters for the whole uh, draft. So our GM decreased from 348 to 148.2 centimeters, and our KG increased from 27.8 to 44.87. So our GM decrease, meaning our stability is less, but since we have a, a trimaran, it's not, it's not a pontoon, it's a trimaran because we can store uh, things in our holes. That makes a difference between a pontoon and a, you know, a trimaran, but so, those are the properties that we got after loading. And the boat was pretty stable. We tested it yesterday in rough water. It was really windy. And before we tested it, we had to do this because people kept saying, they looked at it, they were saying, oh, it's gonna sink, it's too heavy, wherever. But I mean, we knew that with this program, we could estimate it before sinking it. Even the guys at the base are like, what is this called, the Titanic? <laughs> they said it's gonna sink, but we knew it wasn't gonna sink. We got like a 10 centimeter, 12 centimeter uh, clearance in the app. I don't even call it Costa Concordia. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was going to sink to the bottom. The Costa didn't, didn't sink to the bottom. So. But yeah. Slightly out of order here, so can you go one slide forward? So, for the construction plan, as you can see, we started with the hull. We have a bunch of pictures towards the end, so we'll just give you the overview, then show the pictures. But we started with the hole because, like one of my group members mentioned, we got that from a previous senior design project. So it was in the shop, admittedly in pieces, so we had to get it welded back together. Uh, and then it was reinforced transversely so we could mount a big heavy plywood deck and a whole bunch of equipment on the deck. Uh, then next up, we built the collection system which involves several treadmills, which are pulled apart for their belts and rollers. Belts were stitched together, cleats were added, and they were mounted on the boat. Up next, we did the containment system. This is our second iteration of the containment system. Really lightweight, chicken wire, plastic, and galvanized steel, so everything's rust proof. And then, last thing we've been working on is the propulsion system, which is the motors, the speed controller, and the Arduino RC assembly. So back a slide. So this is an overview for our control system. So everything starts with a transmitter, which is a off-the-shelf Hobby King transmitter. So it operates at 2.4 gigahertz, which is industry standard for RC at this point. It's also really nice because you basically eliminate the risk of interference. Like if someone else is flying something nearby where you're collecting, you won't get cross signals. So that's good. That talks to a receiver that's on the vessel, and then some inputs from the receiver go to the Arduino. Those are for a relay, so we've got relays for reversing the motors, and then we've got a relay that turns the conveyor on and off. So the Arduino interprets the uh, pulse width modulation from the receiver, converts it to a digital zero or one, and just sends that out to the relay. For the speed controllers, uh, had to do a little bit of math um, we changed the PWM 
our, uh, there's a command on the Arduino that just reads the width of the pulse. So the wider the pulse, the more throttle signal we have. And so we interpret that in the Arduino and then send it out as sort of a fake analog signal. So it's zero to five volts, but instead of being steady, it's the duty cycle has changed. And that's what goes for a speed controller. And that's how it throttles. And then for the rudders, um, we just used some really beefy off the shelf servos for that. And so we bypass the Arduino completely because the rudders are made to read the same PWM that the transmitter is giving the receiver. So that's all good. Um, as an aside, it turns out the servos were a bit too big for our power supply for everything. So they're actually on a separate power circuit, but control comes from the same place. So here's some of the pictures. Um, I guess we'll work clockwise. Up here you've got the first wiring at the circuit breaker box. Uh, here's our latest and greatest trash collecting system. This is the hull after bracing. So this beam, this beam, this beam, those were all there originally. Uh, Chris and Andrew added all of the angle iron there. Here we've got our frame for our collector as well as the belt. So the belt, treadmill belt stitched together, aluminum cleats. Here's the, uh, the drain pan that goes underneath this containment. So water will fall through the, uh, the yellow plastic extrusion onto the containment and just wash down the stern of the ship. We wanted it off the stern because all of our electronics are mounted in the pontoon, so we, we wanted to minimize risk of water intrusion here because our motors do not like salt water. <laughs> Excellent. This also helps to hold the containment in place on deck. Yeah. The, 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 the wooden, yeah, the wooden train. Yep. So here we've got some pictures of us testing the hole in the pool. This is the original hole, so we've just got the deck plate, and this is without all the angle iron reinforcement, as well as without the center extra pontoon. We did not have nearly enough freeboard with Chris and JT standing on it. So that's how we came to the conclusion that we needed the points. <laughs> oh, and then I think the last group must have had some kind of bilge pump system because there, there are several plugs in these Atmos compartments. So we realized that, oh, hey, there's water coming in through here. So we sealed them up and they no longer leak. Slide. Here's the third pontoon. Um, this was at the mounting. After that, it's since been just spray foam sealed, silicone sealed. No chance of water entry there. Uh, these are the light ship measurements that Sebastian took. And as you can see here, the boat now holds three of us instead of just two. So we got the additional points you need from that. Slide. So these pictures were all taken yesterday. Um, this was the process of float testing the vessel. So as you can see here, we're lifting it onto a dolly, onto a trailer. And then out here, we're at Sea Surveys Galveston, lifting it off the trailer and putting it in the water. So our lights work, which is good. Generator started right up, breakers work perfectly. So, so far it's going good. So, like I said, float test works, control system works. Um, so that's all good. Okay. Conveyor system does pick up trash. It does turn on when we command it to carry trash up. Haven't had any problems with that. Uh, the, um, the one ongoing issue we have though is with the motor speed controller for propulsion. So spent the past couple of weeks bothering Dr. Cody about this. Um, and what we think is happening or one of the things we think is happening is that the controllers want a very strict analog signal. Um, and I guess the 980 kilohertz PWM signal the Arduino gives it isn't quite good enough at spoofing that. So our next plan of action is to get a digital to analog converter, which is a module you can get for your Arduino and try from there. So that's that. All right, so here's the, the team who design contributions. So we have Andrew, who's a build plane design, did a lot of the construction, also with Christopher and Sebastian. Right, 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 right. 
by some kind of you blocking a view from anyone. So when you want to talk to me, walk there. Yes. Uh, myself was the, the PM of the group, the design management and construction. When I was able to come, I was uh, getting down dirty with them. Sebastian did a lot of SDE and Excel, uh, design, test, and construction, and, uh, and, and SDE. Luca was a project scheduler and he did handle all the RC assembly. Christopher, man, the myth, the legend. Uh, he spent like 140 hours or man hours in the past month. He was sleeping. Boat together. So, I was sitting on weekends. He was sleeping. There. Yeah, yeah. He, was sleeping. <laughs> he was sleeping on the boat. Yeah. <laughs> um, he also was a good man for First Janet and uh, Dallas Bay Foundation. And James Christian was a coach of standards and also with construction. With all our big group, everybody had to chip in with construction because we probably hit 500 man hours. A lot of time. So thank God it wasn't uh, pay per hour. Okay. Any uh, questions?